Shavua Tov, everyone. Wonderful to be here. First of all, a shout out to the primary school students of Share Torah. You guys, yeah, great, okay, good. I'm impressed you're here, get an early night though. Heinrich Hein, the great German poet, once described the Torah as the portable homeland of the Jewish people. He said, wherever the Jews are, they're not really living in that place. Where they're living is actually in the Torah. And that was a very, very insightful description of the Jewish people. When the Jewish people were in Babylon, in the academies of Sura and Pumpadissa, over a thousand, five hundred years ago, we were not really in Babylon, we were still at Sinai. We were just in a different development of the Sinai revelation. And when the Jews spread to the shores of the Mediterranean, whether it was Cordoba, whether it was Narbonne in France, whether it was Tunisia, Alexandria in Egypt, we weren't really there, we were still at Sinai. We were still attached to that tradition of Sinai and we had a relationship with the Torah. And wherever he moved, whether it be to Lithuania, Johannesburg, Melbourne, Australia, we were li living and still are living at Mount Sinai. Because the Jewish people, more than just a homeland, we have a love relationship with the Torah. The Lubavitcher Rebbe asked an interesting question. He says, you know, we received the, the, the festival at which we received the Torah, we celebrate that on Shavuot. Shavuot is a celebration of Sinai. And yet, he says, when do we have our greatest joy? When do we dance around like maniacs with the Torah scrolls? When do we hug and kiss the Torah? When do we drink l'chaims? When do we dance around the shul for hours and hours? It is not on Shavuos. It is on Simchas Torah. Why is that so? That's very strange, especially since Shavuot predates the celebration of the completion of the Torah cycle of reading throughout the year. It predates it by many, many centuries. The custom of finishing the Torah over the course of the year was, was, was later, was in Babylon. The celebration of Simchat Torah is much greater than that of Shavuos. And the Lubavitcher Rebbe had a brilliant and beautiful answer. He said the following. He said, on Shavuot, we received the Torah. We received it as passive recipients. God gave it to us. It is what is known in Aramaic, Hisarusa de la inspiration from above. He says, it came from above, we received it as passive recipients. However, on Simchat Torah, when we have read the Torah over the course of an entire year, we are no longer passive recipients, we are active participants in the Torah. We have read it, we have studied it, we have memorized it, we have chanted it, we have taught it to our children, we've read it publicly in synagogue. We're not just passive recipients. There's a much greater joy in being an active partner, in being a participant, than in merely being a passive recipient. And consequently, that is why we express that joy primarily on Simchat Torah, not mainly and not primarily on Shavuot. But that love relationship is expressed in other ways as well, not just in the once a year celebration of Simchat Torah, but it's expressed in the fact that Jews for thousands of years have been getting together under incredible circumstances and studying Torah. Story is told in Why the Jews by Tolushkin and Prager about a non-Jewish academic who was visiting Warsaw to do a study of the Jews of Warsaw before the Second World War, before they were wiped out. And he's in Warsaw in one of the Jewish neighborhoods and he's looking for a taxi, which at the time were horse-drawn carriages. There's a line of carriages, horse-drawn carriages. There's a couple of Jewish kids feeding carrots to the horses, and there's no drivers in sight. So he walks over to one of the kids, and he was able to speak Yiddish, and he says, where are the drivers? And the kid says, come, I'll take you. And he takes him into a small cloise, a shul, small synagogue in Warsaw, and there the Jewish taxi drivers are sitting around a table, with books open. And the academic asks the boy, he says, are they praying? Because we know taxi drivers often take time to pray and their, their passengers pray fervently. So, <laughs> so he sees them around and the child says to this professor, he says, they're not praying, they're studying law. And he was amazed, Jewish taxi drivers taking off time in the middle of the day in Warsaw and they're sitting around studying Jewish law. 
I mean, just to put this in perspective, imagine you're on Fifth Avenue in New York. There's a bunch of yellow cabs lined up, some street youth watching the cabs. So you walk over to one of the, you're looking for a, a, a taxi. It's right outside the New York Public Library. And you're looking for a taxi, there's no drivers. You walk over to the street youth and you say, respect. Said, need to get back, need to get back to the hood. Where are the drivers? So he says, come, I'll show you. Takes you into the New York Public Library and there in a small room off the main reading room, New York City taxi drivers are sitting studying the Constitution of the United States of America. What is the probability of this ever happening? What are the chances? If they're going to study anything, I would put driving as a number one, English and personal hygiene as number two. <laughs> the idea that these guys are studying, it doesn't happen. There are other societies where professionals study. Yes, priests and imams and people who are professors of religion, they study. But in Judaism, we all study. In Judaism, we're all partners in the Torah. Every single one of us is a tradition. Our sages tell us that every Jew is represented by a letter in the Torah. Every one of us is indeed a letter in the Torah, but actually it's more than that. We actually write that letter through our study because every single one of us has a unique perspective and understanding of the Torah. And every single one of us, the Torah, the divine Torah, needs the understanding of all of us. There's a verse in our prayers, Ashkenazim say, V'ten chelkeinu b'toratecha, place Give us our portion in your Torah, which means give us our unique portion in the Torah. But the Eidot HaMizrach, the Jews of North Africa, Jews of the Middle East, they have a slightly different version. They say, Vesim Chelkeinu B'Toratecha, which means place our portion in your Torah. It's a request to God that the portion of Torah that we revealed through our study the portion of Torah that we reveal through our unique perspective, he should take that and place it in his Torah in heaven, which we are actually writing. The base Halevi of Yosef Dov Soloveitchik points out, he says the majority of the Torah for over 1,500 years was not in written form, it was oral. It wasn't until the 3rd century CE that Judah the Prince wrote it down in the form of a Mishnah. But for 1,500 years before it was oral. Why would God give the Torah in an unwritten fashion? Why did he not write it down? I mean, for heaven's sakes, I want things in writing. I'm dealing with a few million Jews over thousands of years. I'd like it in writing. So God doesn't put it in writing. He makes it primarily oral. So Rav Soloveitchik puts it this way, he says, had the Torah been completely written down, the Jewish people would be like the ark in which the Torah scroll is placed. The ark, the Aron Kodesh, is very holy. It's a beautiful thing, it's a receptacle of holiness. But he says, if the entire Torah is written down, the Jews would be the receptacle of a separate entity known as the Torah, which is holy, the receptacle is holy, but not quite the same as the Torah itself. He says, when the Torah is not written down, the Jews are not only the receptacle in which the Torah is placed, but we are the parchment upon which the Torah is written. We are the cloth, the parchment of the Torah itself. And that is still true today, even though so much of the Torah has been written down, but the Torah that you learn, the Torah that you study, the perspective that you come up with, when you learn, when you study with someone, Pirkei Avot, when you study with someone, the weekly portion, when you listen to a class on the internet, when you, when you listen to a CD, I think it's left CDs, probably, right. You listen to a CD, etc. He's then that, your understanding, your perspective, and your unique contribution is actually turning you into the, the, the parchment upon which the Torah is written. That is our obligation, and this is something which we can do. We are in a passionate, loving relationship with the Torah. It was a rabbi who once met the Archbishop of Canterbury. And the Archbishop said to him, he says, you Jews have this incredibly legalistic tradition with so many laws. And he says, it seems to be very dry. Where's the passion? And the rabbi said to him, he said, let me ask you something. Don't you have books of canon law, church law? He says, of course we do. He says, do you have them in the church? And the Archbishop said, yes, we do. And the rabbi said to him, does your congregation ever take the books out of the shelves, kiss them, hug them, and dance around with them? He says, of course not. So the rabbi said, where's the passion? The passion is in the fact, not just that we dance with the Torah, and that we hug it, and that we kiss it, 
but the passion is and that we have a conversation with it that we continue the conversation that our ancestors started at Mount Sinai, continued through Babylon and through, through France and Spain and Istanbul and Eastern Europe and Lithuania and all the way down to Johannesburg. And we continue that conversation. We are writing our own Torah, which God is going to place in his divine Torah in heaven. That is what we are able to do. That is our obligation. That is our capability to have that passion, that love relationship, so that all of us will contribute our unique letter to the ultimate divine Torah. Thank you. Whoa. You think it's easy to stand in front of 5,000 people, don't you? I mean, everyone's just walking out here and talking in front of 5,000 people like it's the most real, normal thing to do in the world. Would you like to try it? Any raise of hands, any volunteers? There's always one, isn't there? It's always you, sir, isn't it? I'm amazed I do something professionally that most people would think, on, on lists you see this, as the singular most scary thing to do in the whole of the world, which is speak in public. Today I've been asked with all these other wonderful, extraordinary, inspiring Jews to speak on the, the subject today we can. <clears throat> see how they left it kind of ambiguous enough that you could kind of do anything you want with it? So. I'm going to take the most literal approach I can to this. Today, in the next 24 hours, we can. I still get nervous when I speak. I have to tell you the story. I'm sure I'm going to regret telling the story. And could you just turn all the cameras and videos off a second? Do we have the power to do that? It's probably too late to ask of that, isn't it? Um, when I first started speaking many years ago, I was invited actually to South Africa by a certain wonderful organization, and I hadn't really gone public, I was just kind of in my own club in Jerusalem teaching, and they asked me to come here, and it was the most nerve wracking people were paying me to go to a whole other country with a plane flight to speak in front of somebody. And, I, and, and you know, you have to be worth it. Why are they laughing at me? I, what? what? And this pressure consumed me for like two months. Like, you know, how clever and smart and deep and funny can I be to justify plane flights and picking me up at the airport and throwing me in front of an audience? And up to the last second, it was the most nerve-wracking, you know, fear-based, my fears, my doubts, my confusion. Who am I? What do I want? Why am I doing this? And how do I be good enough? And then I got all religious about it, you know, all about does God want me to be good and what have I done wrong in my life? And getting religious makes everything worse, trust me. I know I'm not supposed to say that out loud, but okay, we'll, we'll fix it in post, right? And I remember this moment, my breakthrough moment. And I'm Hasidically inclined, hence the Hasidic things here. So I'm going in the mikveh, it's one of those holy things you do, and I'm dunking up and down, and my body is overwhelmed with fear, with confusion, and I'm going on in, you know, an hour. And I'm just going, you know, I'm thinking, you know, Shem, please, could I be worthy? Please, could I do tshuva? And I forget all the things I've done, you know. I, and, oh, my gosh, I messed up, and I, I should have prepared more, and I've had thought of a better tshuva, and, and I, oh, wow, this, and I, I messed up with this organization. I should have, man, and what do I have to do? How do I get myself ready, and how do I find the right line, and how do I say the right thing? And when you focus on yourself, there's no end to how much stuff we have. And I was blessed, thank the good Lord, to have a breakthrough moment. And the breakthrough moment was suddenly when it popped into my head. Who cares about me? When you stand in front of 100 people, 500 people, all of South Africa, 
Who said this is about you, the speaker? Who cares about your fears? Who cares about your teaching trajectory, your professional trajectory? Who cares about whether you prepared enough? And the second I thought, who am I speaking to and what are their challenges and their needs? I could never explain to you in this in the right words, in the right way. I was filled with such an incredible light, such an incredible strength. Every word that I needed to say, every soul that I needed to touch, it was there, it was tangible and real. The fear dissolved, the ego dissolved, the confusion dissolved, and I was 100% on and 100% present. And I've realized, learning many of the mystical writings of Hasidus, of Kabbalah, of Musa, that this is a classic duality that we all live with constantly. There's the Nefesh of Bahamas, the lower self, our beliefs, our understandings, our confusions, our pains, our life experience, our memories. And then there's something else we embody within us, something infinitely greater, more powerful, more beautiful, more electric, more alive. You all have, I have no doubt, a moment in your life when in the moment of pressure, of confusion, of, 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 of something had to go and you thought, I don't do it, I can't do it, I don't have the, the patience, the strength, the courage, the discipline, the knowledge, the wisdom, the clarity, and something pushes you over and you tap into a place which is lamala mina me, higher than the usual me. Hands up if you've ever experienced that in your life. Hands up if you have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> hands up if you want to put your hands up, but you actually lost them sometimes over Shabbos and you're sitting there with your... Was that demanding too much audience participation from South Africa? Is this like... That's what it's going to be like for the next 24 hours, huh? Uh-huh. I know that you know that I know that you know what I'm talking about. Don't think about that. It'll just confuse you. You have within you something which is more than who you think you are. And the way to access that is something that's called in all our writings and our tradition, Kedusha. When I use the English word holy, it just kind of sounds all religious. And I wouldn't want it to sound that. Kedusha, we have words for, think of something which is holy. Think of someone you know holy. If you have a, a black hat, you've been brainwashed as bad as I have. So you'll think of someone with a very big beard and, you know, who knows all of the Torah and someone who closes their eyes and does this a lot when they're davening or just when they're nervous. <laughs> Me backstage for the last two hours. <laughs> and if you're more mystically inclined, meaning Buddhism, <laughs> then you'll imagine that guy eating mulberries where you can kind of see his bones sticking out from what used to be skin. What Kedusha is generally described as in all kind of ancient traditions is the concept of what we call in Judaism precious, which means separation from the world. I don't go after my desires, I don't go after lust, after sexuality, after physical eating, after ego, and I, I pull myself in from the world. But I have to tell you something, the true mystics say that Kedusha, holiness, and a life committed to holiness is not about that at all, it's about something much deeper. Torah is not there as a wonderful Jew behind the stage just told me. Torah was never there to separate us from the outer world. Torah was there to stop us from separating ourselves from our inner world. The most beautiful definition I ever heard of Kedusha is an uncompromising dedication to living according to one's true self, highest self. And I'm unwilling to allow my fears, doubts, lust, ego to get in my way. And I'm unwilling to allow the everyday life, the everyday mundane life, my habits. I go to school, I get a job, I get a college degree, I have a wife, I have kids. I read those books, I check on my Facebook once a day. And if I'm religious, I do my daf yomi. And I daven and I mumble my words. And I live light according to rote, according to habit. But there's something Hashem says that you can go deeper in. You can connect deeper to. One of my favorite stories of all time is the story of the Kotzke Rebbe. A great genius, a great master of the revealed Torah, a great master of the hidden Torah, a, a spiritual angel, a spiritual master. And he's sitting in his base medrash one night in the middle of the night and all his students are learning and all his students also have learned long beards and all his students are also masters of the Torah. 
And as he's sitting there learning, suddenly the Rebbe has something to say, a new idea, a chiddish, something to share, and he, he bangs on the shtender. And he calls the students forward, and his students are chalishing, they're desperate, they want to hear some beautiful, inspiring words from the Rebbe. And they lean forward, they're waiting for his genius. And the Rebbe leans forward, and they lean forward, and he looks up and asks a question. It's got to be some bomb cash, or some huge question of complex sugya, complex discussion in the Talmud, and he asks them a deep question. He says, where is God? And they look at each other. Are we at Eishat Torah now? They say, oh, are we starting at the beginning? What happened? We're going to start the discovery program, right? We have 15 proofs on the board. Is the baby lost his, uh, you know? That's funny, that gentleman over there. Had an issue with the baby. We can talk about that if you want. Stand up, where you're from. Sorry, I thought we were in Los Angeles. Different audience, I realize. Where is God? They look at each other and they said, Rebbe, okay. Rebbe, God is in Shemayim. God is in the heavens. God is above the clouds. God is above those fat naked babies with wings on playing harp all day. God is la'ela la'ela before the tzimtzum. That law ain't soft. And when the Rebbe hears this, the Rebbe goes, oi. Oi, tati. You understand that's not a question you want to get wrong when you have a hat and a beard and you know all those holy books on the shelf. The Rebbe tries, round two, where is God? And of course they realize, oh, where is God? What did we say? Because they were Hasidim, and Hasidim is something totally new, which is really something totally old, and they should have known the answer. The answer is, God is everywhere. God is in everything, and all the time, in the trees, and the birds, and every man, woman, and child, and every race, color, and creed. God is in this table. God is in the nerves in my stomach. God is everywhere all the time. Rebbe, God is everywhere all the time. And the Rebbe says, oi. Round three, where is God? And they don't know. And they start saying, well, I thought I saw here in the Gemara. I saw, I thought I saw here in the Zohar. Doesn't the Baal Shem Tov say? Doesn't the Rav Nachman say? Doesn't the Altar of Kelm say? Doesn't all the sources start coming off the shelves? And they're showing him in the Achronim. They're pulling the books and the Rebbe's watching, watching. How can such holy people miss the main point? How can such holy people in South Africa miss the main point? Doesn't matter if you're religious, doesn't matter the color of the kippah, doesn't matter no kippah. And finally they come back to them, him, now with a question, the power of the question, the power of saying the three most scary words in the English language, I don't know. But now you have a question, now you have the openness, the willingness, the curiosity. Now you're not talking, now you're receiving. Rebbe, Rebbe, tell us, where is God? And the Rebbe looks up with the power of a holy man dedicated to truth, committed to that through all his body, all his veins, and he says, God is wherever you let him in. You have within you something extraordinary. And what you have within you is not just powerful, it's not just transcendent, it's unique. The power of holiness, people think that we all go into our souls and we're all one. We're all one, it's not true. The more holy you become, the more unique you become. And the more you recognize your uniqueness. And the reason I'm bothering to start this discussion is because having spent a week approximately in this wonderful country, this wonderful community, what I realize is we're all Jews and we're all one. Can we be out loud, honest together? But all really different. And we have different hashkafas. Some of us have no hashkafas. And we have different things that inspire us. Some of us currently have no Judaism that inspires us. And be very, very careful, my holy, beautiful South African friends, that sometimes when we're different, that creates schism, that creates machloikas, that creates us versus them. A holy rabbi of mine said, if you take the letters machloikas, you turn, which means argument, dispute, you turn it around, the letters, you get meis chalik. Meis chalik means that there's death only in single parts because true life True power, true strength is when we're all united together. Where we all reveal something different, but somehow like a song where every note is different, but it makes something beautiful. Where the separate parts transcend themselves to become more than the sum of the parts and reveal something greater. 
the word Yisrael, that's who we are, base Yisrael, it's actually the letters Shir Kale, the song of God. And there's something that has to happen today that us holy people have to begin to find everybody else's song, to acknowledge and validate everybody else's journey, to look into another Jew and say there's something beautiful and unique there. It may be like what I think is cool, it may be like what they think is cool. I had a guy coming to me, I know my clock is ticking and I'm way out of time. Two more hours, please. <laughs> the chief rabbi is like, no, not again. Yes, again. I want to tell you this one story, and if I can do what, what, I, what I can do in this story, then you can do this in the next 24 hours. A yid came to me recently, he wanted me to part of a project. And he's pitching me this project, he wants to use my, some of my Torah in some kind of video, some kind of multimedia thing, he's pitching me, he's got a nice kippah on, he seems to be a firm Jew, he's sitting there with a bunch of rabbis, they're a part of the project. Suddenly, you know, we're having a few discussions, the rabbis get up, he leans to me, he says, Rabbi, I really like you. I was afraid he was going to make a pass at me at that point. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with that. And he says, I have to tell you a secret. I say, what? He rips his kippah off his head. He says, I'm not really from. I rip my kippah off my head. I say, neither am I. <laughs> Didn't see that coming, did he? He said, no, Rabbi, I'm not really from. And he tells me this whole story. His wife became from, and he loves her dearly. And it happened after the marriage, so he kind of goes along with the ride. And he says, but I really love culturally, I appreciate Judaism. And culturally, I, I appreciate the experience, and I want my, my kids to have a Jewish identity. But the truth is, as much as I want to believe, I don't. I'm kind of an atheist at heart. And I said, Kala Kavad. And he looked at me like, you know, what are you getting at? I don't know if anyone reads Rav Cook. Can I say Rav Cook in South Africa? Is that Muta? <laughs> Only some people laugh. Did you hear that? This is what I want to tell you. Rav Cook said atheism is a good thing. Rav Cook said everything in the world, Malach Aretz Kavodoy, has aspects of godliness. And he said atheism will come into the world as a way to open up people who think they, they connect to Judaism. Some of us people like me that think we understand God, but we're really understanding a superficial aspect of God. But the God we sometimes connect to is judgmental, is harsh, it doesn't approve of me. And people, there's some people like my good friend over there, that he's saying, you know, I, I don't, it doesn't make sense to me that there's a God that's so close-minded, that's so over-focused on details, that's so angry if my kids do or don't have the right kippah. And he says, it doesn't make sense to me, I can't believe it. So I said to him, as a famous line from Rav Nachman, I agree with you, because the God that you don't believe in, I also don't believe in. And I say, I encourage you, Holy Yid, because of your purity and commitment to find depth and passion and meaning, then perhaps you're being skeptical as part of your process and color kavod to your process. And I want to tell you what this atheist did at that moment. He cried. And he said, no one's ever spoken to him about that. And at that moment, I realized something cosmic, that even atheists, need validation from God. I'm asking everybody in the next 24 hours to make an extra effort that what the Sinai and Daba, what happens to the Sinai and Daba on stage with all those cool, wonderful, deep rabbis and rabbits and storytellers is very wonderful. But you know, as the chief rabbi will tell you himself, we're all gonna fly away in a few hours. And unfortunately, the rest of you are left to deal with each other then. But in the truth that you find, and the wisdom that you find, and the holiness that you find, see where it hits you in the heart. See what it reveals of the depth of who you are. See what it clarifies in your life. Be conscious of what it opens up for you. Torah has that power. And when you're going through that process, look around at the people and realize they're also awakening to that holiness, to that uniqueness, that love. And encourage them, validate them. Not validate them to run forward in your direction. Validate them 
on that journey. If anything we do wrong in the film world, sometimes we forget the journey is as important as the goal. Let's embrace each other's journey. Let's hold each other in that space. And together, the true Torah of depth of uniqueness will be revealed to us. And when we find that holiness, together we will be able to make a place where we can reveal Hashem, the higher truth, and the higher reality, our higher potential into South Africa and through that into the world. Thank you. Tov to everybody. Berishus, the chief rabbi, that is this time right now to give him a thankful for this beautiful idea to brought together the old brothers and sisters in thinking I can be closer to God. Rabbi Goldstein, Yashar Koach, in the name from everybody. <clears throat> I've been born six generation in Jerusalem. After the Six Day War, in 1967, the fourth day that I come to the Western Wall in Jerusalem, the Kotel, you must understand and you, you know that before the wall, the wall, everybody thinks that Israel is destroyed, finished. Six days later, God makes a miracle in six days. Israel succeeds Egypt, come close to Cairo, come close to Damascus, Lebanon, Iraq, Come back to Yerushalayim, and there I stay by the Kotel of Maravi. And I say to myself, what can I give back God? A thankful for these miracles. Six days before, everybody thinks that it's finished. And right now, I'm staying here by the Kotel of Maravi. I say I will leave Yerushalayim because the most important for God, the best gift that you can give God, the best present if you caring for his children. I will leave Yerushalayim, I will go to Migdala Emek. Migdala Emek, why but right now the chief rabbi was the worst place all over Israel. Crime, drugs, every day in the papers they blew up the city. I decided I will go there, volunteer myself one, one year, walk with the youngsters. I come there, I was naive, come from Eya Sharim, Yerushalayim. The first question what I ask, who is the yeshiva? What yeshiva? <laughs> who is the Talmud Torah? What Talmud Torah? Who can I find the youngsters? They say the disco. <laughs> disco? I never hear disco in my life. In Eya Sharim, you don't know what means the disco. I think maybe it's a yeshiva called disco. <laughs> I go to the yeshiva disco and I see, and I see poor in the middle, in the middle of the hill. <laughs> Dancing pop, eh? They look at me that I come to the disco. They thinking, what happened here? <laughs> maybe somebody died, I look for a minion, for Kaddish. I say to them, I come here because I love you, because you're my brother. I want to be with you. You crazy? You live Yerushalayim? I say yes, because you got children, you're my brothers. 
I became like a magnet with the, with the guys in the kingdom name in Israel, the disco lover in this time. <laughs> they make a movie in 1970, Israel television make a movie called Disco Rabbi. Then my home became a disco, became close to the guys. Somebody tell me my brother's in jail. I say, your brother's my brother. I come to the jail. First time I see a jail, not to believe in Israel, Moshe, Yaakov, Yitzchok, jail, Israel, Jewish boys. One time I was in New York, I received a telephone call from Benjamin Klan, the secretary for Lebabacher Rebbe, today was the yard site. It says the Rebbe is by the cave from the Friedrich Rebbe, son of his father-in-law. This was the only time by him. The Rebbe asked, Rav Grossman is in New York, ask him to go visit a prisoner in Sing Sing. Sing Sing, New York is the worst prison, out prison. To visit a Jew and to give him a coachman. I come to Sing Sing, I go in, I say every time I joke, I go in. The old black people stay up. They think that Abe Lincoln come to free him. <laughs> but here, here in Israel, in Israel, Jewish kids, Jewish kids, I started to walk with them, make a program, started to learning Pirkei Avot. Pirkei Avot, very important. Remember Pirkei Avot. Little by little, I see they the mamish, they change themselves. By the way, right away, when we sit here, we have right now in the program more from 1,000 prisoners. The government says that is the most success program that they have. 70% don't go back to, to jail. What is the secret? They ask me, they have psychiatrists, sociologists, psychologists, everything, <laughs> not, nothing is working. And here, people come and learn Torah. What is the answer? The answer is every Jew has a neshame, as a soul. The answer is that the Torah tells us that Abraham Avinu, the, the father Abraham, when he's old 100 years, he has no children. He asked God, give me children. God says to him, you will have so much children like the dust of the land. Abraham Avinu don't respond. Abraham, don't respond, don't say anything. He says again, God, give me kingdom. Ain't li loino sota zera, you don't give me children. But God promise you, you will have so much like the dust. Only then, God says to Avram of Inu, to Abraham, go out, look in the heaven and look in the stars. You will have so many kids like the stars. Then Avram Avinu became happy and he says, this is the children what I, what I want. What is the message? When Avram Avinu hears, Abraham hears that his children will be like the dust of the land, this means materialistic children. Avram Avinu says, I want to have spiritual children. Children, only materialism, this is not for me, this is not my dream. Then God take him out and say, your children will be spiritual children. They will be connected with God. Then Abraham Avinu became happy because he wanted to have these children. And since then, Every Jew became from God a special soul that he can have the connection. You only need to come, speak to him, give him love. I make one day a party in Hanukkah, party in jail. I left the jail. Certainly, spontaneously, I give a kiss one from the prisoners. Two days later, he write me a letter, Rabbi, I've been the prisoner that you give me a kiss. This is the first time in my life that somebody kissed me. This teach me that I must to take the kids before they go to jail. And in 1973, I started Migdalol, the institution, with 18 boys 
And today, Baruch Hashem, we have more from 6,000 children, 20,000 graduate, all movement, the old crime go down. Everything with love and feeling. I was one day invited by Rabbi Riskin in New York. He was the rabbi in Lincoln Square Synagogue. I stay by him in home Friday night, and then Friday night they take me to the hotel. They have a room, this, the synagogue for guests. Going to the hotel, I see many people speaking Hebrew, a big building, everybody Hebrew in New York. I ask, what is this? They say, this is Disco Tel Aviv. Disco Tel Aviv? I say, Rabbi Riskin, I have the disco, Rabbi, let's go in. <laughs> he can't believe, go in with a Ashtraimu. In, the, in disco, I say, come, you will see something. I come in, in the disco, Friday night, I started, Shalom Aleichem, Malachi Yashalom. Two minutes, everybody stops the music. I say, please, sit down. You make Kiddush? No, you have wine. What wine? I take, who knows from you make Kiddush? One says, he knows. I say, I give you a kippah. I have every time two kippahs, you know. Ready. <laughs> I give him a kippah, and he started to make Kiddush, and then an hour and a half singing, speaking, this place used to be an open in Kippur. After they did tomorrow, many from the youngsters come to Rabriskin. He, he put in this story in his book. What you see, you see again every Jew as the soul from God. This is the dream from Abraham Avinu. You, my friends, here, you, the stars from Avraham Avinu, you coming here to this convention to show that you, the stars, you want to have spiritual, not only materialism. You want to hear what means the Torah, what means mitzvahs, what means to be close, help one down, love your brother like you love yourself. This is the idea from the Sinai Convention right now. Sinai is the symbol that we receive the Torah. And when we do receive the Torah, the Torah says, Ke ish echod Everybody comes like one house. You don't say religious, not religious, Svardim, Ashkenazim. This, every Jew is an Eshome. And with you coming here, you show God that you want to be closed. You, the children from Avram Avinu, please. When you finish this convention, take the lights from the town with you. Go home, speak to your neighbor, invite them for Kiddush, invite them to make the Shabbos candle. Speak to them, send your children to Jewish schools. We need to have the Jewish boys and girls so much left, they don't know anything. Let them to know what is Avram Avinu. Let them to know what is Moshe Rabbeinu. Let them to know what is David Amelech. And in this house, together soon, we will see the Geulah Shleime. Amen.